Uh, performance uh, shown on the horizontal axis is averaging time from 1 to 10,000 seconds on the vertical axis is distance in picometers, 1, 10, 100. And you can see that for minutes to hours, uh, we're attaining 2 picometers um, uh, stability. And uh, as I say, it, it, it degrades a bit at, at shorter times, so and we need to improve that a little bit for this experiment. Uh, this shows the, uh, in the contents of the vacuum chamber and the test masses of the equivalence principle experiment. This uh, is the optical bench, which is a little over a half meter tall, contains a sh an upper shelf with a test mass on and a lower shelf with a test mass on, and then some optics in the middle for launching the beam. And uh, this is all designed to stand, uh, to stand the 6G turnaround acceleration. And um, uh, the test masses sit on three tungsten feet in tungsten Vs, uh, one on each shelf. Uh, there is a test mass. There's a brass screw in the top for adjusting the position of the center of mass. That turns out to be important in reducing a systematic effect. Um, and here's an exploded view of a test mass uh, showing the, the, um, uh, the corner cube in the middle and uh, the <coughs> see how the corner cube looks out. Not really. Um, and there's a spring here which holds the corner cube down. The corner cube weighs a tenth of a pound, and it's about 10 pounds of force on the spring. So it's not going anywhere. It's gently but solidly held, so it's not going anywhere during the 6G bounce, where it will experience less than a pound of force. Um, but, uh, and it won't be distorted by the, by the spring of the clamps either, and it will remain uh, in a well-defined position. Uh, it's important that the center of mass and the optical center of the corner cube uh, coincide because the freely falling test mass will rotate around its center of mass. But the, uh, you also want it to rotate around the optical center of the corner cube because that's the point at which there's no distance change. If you rotate the optical center of the corner cube uh, around some point removed distant from the optical center, then you have a little parabola in distance. If you rotate at a constant rate, you get a little parabola in, in height of the optical center, first class, uh, first class error effect. So you adjust those with the trim screw to make them coincide, and just by using tosses of the, of the instrument with the laser gauge, the point I realized is always nice in science to be able to use your high precision measurement for as many different things as you can. And here you can use it to find out where the, where the, uh, the center of mass is and uh, put, it, put it where it belongs. Next. Uh, so that, that's the first major technology, which is the laser gate. The next technology uh, I first need to introduce a need for. Uh, we're going around the Earth at 700 miles an hour, as I mentioned. And that means that the test masses experience about a tenth of a percent of their weight in uh, uh, need to produce the, uh, you need to produce the centripetal acceleration, or if you if you sort of drop the pedantic freshman physics attitude, you get you got a centrifugal force. So you you um, you. If you if you add in velocity to that, you do so at your peril. Uh, the scale is 10 to the minus 9 of 700 miles an hour, which turns out to set a requirement of one quarter nanometer per second on the difference of velocities of two test masses in this experiment. Um, and so that's a fairly tight requirement. And we, uh, we realized we could, we could achieve it optically. We started designing um, elaborate, expensive Christmas tree ornaments uh, that we were going to put in our bouncing apparatus. Um, uh, elaborate glass structures to pipe light in and look at quad cells and so forth. And then we realized that we could do it much, much more simply. And we had some side benefits as well. Uh, and that's using the capacitance gauge. So we got this Coriolis force we need to get rid of. We need to measure the velocity very accurately. If you look at, if you make the test mass the center part of a differential capacitor, in fact, it's the center part of five differential capacitors, um, you can determine its position extremely accurately. Capacitance gauges have been used for picometer work in the past. It's a, a fairly familiar technique. What's not familiar is to have the measured object be unconnected to anything. Remember, I don't want any springs attached to that thing. So uh, the next slide. 
we see the geometry of the capacitance gauge. Um, the, the test mass sits in the middle here. We drive the two electrodes shown in green, just one, one pair of electrodes is shown. Drive those with opposite uh, sine waves at a known frequency F1, uh, which for us is, is 10 to 18 kilohertz. Um, the, if the test mass is exactly centered between the green electrodes, there'd be no signal on it because it picks up plus from one and minus on the other and, and the capacitance is the same. However, when it wanders a little closer to this electrode, then a signal in phase with that phase of F1 is picked up and so the, tech, the test mass has one sign and goes over the other, it has the other sign. Now you need to measure the voltage on the test mass. Again, you're not allowed to touch it. So you put a big ring around the middle to pick up as much signal as you can and you optimize the geometry, blah, blah, blah. And, and that is roughly the right actual scale of the, of the geometry. You pick up a signal capacitively from the test mass. And now without having any wires connected to the test mass, I've made a capacitance measurement, bring the signal out through an amplifier. Now I've got uh, a signal, a signal uh, here at this frequency which I was driving with, with whose magnitude and sign give me the uh, offset of the test mass from center between the electrodes. Uh, digitize that with one of these wonderful, ripping fast, very accurate ADCs which have been developed for no purpose at all by the audio industry, but we love them in science, and send them to a capacitor, I mean a, a computer, which, which has a, uh, a correlator which it turns out is loafing. A 3 gigahertz PC needs less than 1% of the CPU to analyze the data, depending on how it's going. Actually, five channels of the um, Four channels. Um, so out of, out of the computer comes a tenth of that amount of data in terms of uh, estimates of position. And uh, now what I, what I didn't fully say is that I've got five sets of electrodes around this test mass to measure the X and Y position of the top and bottom and a weak measurement of the Z position when you apply electric field vertically at your apparel. Um, you have then five frequencies sent to the ADC and that's the correlator's job is to pull out five different channels by correlating against five different sines and five different cosines. So um, this system is all being uh, developed for us by Winfield Hill at the Roland Institute and we've got a master's student from the University of Southampton who's, who's working on it on our end. And uh, it's coming along nicely. Uh, next slide. Uh, this shows the schematic of the, of the five electrodes and here is the first electrode set. These are Gen 1 electrodes, mock-ups. Uh, they'll be extremely unstable mechanically because the electrodes just have to hang out there in space. Uh, what I envisioned for the Gen 3 electrodes would be gold plated on, on the inside of silica or something like that uh, so that you've got stable dimensions uh, and as much of the wiring plated on, on fuse silica as, as well. And how are we going to make those? I don't know. This is the problem. Next. Okay, that's, um, that, that's the capacitance gauge technology. The third major technology we need is the mechanical motion. And um, the concept is very simple. We have two test masses in a vacuum chamber and um, the uh, vacuum chamber is here, and the test masses are sitting on shelves in, in, in the chamber. And if we get to press the button once more, that's how it works. It needs to bounce. And now starts a toss, now ends a toss. Okay. So in this business, drops are when you start at the top. Tosses are when you throw something up from the bottom, and you get twice as much time in free fall four times the distance signal to read. And so everybody wants to toss and not drop, but it's harder because you have to launch when you're moving. Next. So the motion system involves a bouncer, uh, which is based on automotive torsion bars. Um, they're a wonderful way to store energy. They, you, need, you need a certain mass.